All right, so um, awesome. all screen is here. And what did you say, control what? Control L. Control F. Oops. Control F. Okay, get me to a view. Where's the full screen? Here's full screen mode, okay. All right, okay, good morning, guys. As planned, uh, if, if we guys can have your full undivided attention, we have our friend Todd Christensen from Cutler Hammer uh, to present power systems. So switch gears, switch boards, handle boards, maybe a few uh, transformers and so things. So he has a lot of good stuff to show you. Uh, Todd is a friend of Dunwoody, an expert in the field, and he filed on electrical engineering firms um, all over at least Minnesota that I know of, maybe other places. Uh, and a little bit of North Dakota and Western Wisconsin mixed yeah. in. And he will, he will say a few things about himself too. So you have been coming to Dunwoody now for six years, something Might like even this. be eight now. Might be eight, yeah. yeah. After, so eight years, he's familiar with the project that we do. Uh, which is a 600 amp, our project is close to a 600 amp, 28120 three phase system with two panels, receptacle close to 225 amp panel and uh, light the same, almost close to the same number. So that's kind of give you an idea. We have a generator, so auto transfer switch, um, pull for the 600 amp and no, no transformers. It's a 28120 okay. four wire service. So that's what we have. Um, I'm going to let you move out of here and I'll let you, uh, Todd you guys take it from here. He's an expert. You guys grab the color hammer book and have it in front of you. Thank you, Todd, and go ahead. All right. Thanks, Chad. Uh, as Chad mentioned, uh, I am an uh, application engineer for uh, Eaton Corporation. Chad mentioned Cutler Hammer. Um, Eaton Corporation, if you've been around a number of years, you remember a company called Westinghouse. A guy named George Westinghouse, I think, invented the light bulb, and that was the battle between AC and DC, and what's going to power our cities if you go back 100 and some years. Uh, huh? Exactly, as the old Tesla Eskinos. Um, uh, so around 1994, there's a, a company called Eaton Corporation who owned a company called Cutler Hammer who made a lot of... Uh, Pretty good at control and residential type products, load centers, small things like that. And then uh, in 1994, they purchased Westinghouse. Now, Westinghouse was a major electrical switchgear manufacturer. So they did a lot, of, uh, a lot of big stuff when it comes to utility distribution, medium voltage, 15,000 volt distribution, industrial companies, large high-rise buildings, all the way down to the panel boards and switchboards that are going to be part of the projects that you're looking at. And uh, so since 1994, um, uh, Eaton Corporation has kind of been the, uh, that is the, the master company that, that owns a bunch of different brands. And in addition to the Westing, those are the switchgear type uh, products that we make. We also uh, manufacture UPSs. Um, and then we go uh, into a bunch of stuff that isn't even electrical, things like uh, uh, hydraulic launch assist. So this is like your hybrid school buses or dump trucks that use hydraulics to double the fuel mileage. Uh, things like uh, aerospace, if you see the big uh, uh, Airbus or the 7, uh, what's the new one, the 787s, I think, the new, you know, the planes that fly uh, up on the, uh, through the air, you know, they're all driven by uh, fuel efficiency. That's one of the biggest costs they have. So, you know, what we do for them is we make uh, I believe it's 5,000 PSI hoses that run all the hydraulic fluid that does all the control. And that knocks tons off the weight of a plane, which therefore makes it more uh, fuel efficient. So Eaton Corporation is, uh, our, our theme is um, uh, powering businesses. So we're very good at how we do power, making it more efficient, making it uh, easier to manage. And uh, today, we're not going to talk about any of that kind of stuff. We're going to focus on uh, some electrical distribution stuff. Um, I guess, as Chad mentioned, I call on consulting engineers primarily. When I was in town, I uh, came in here about 2003. And uh, I got to work for about a year and a half or so with uh, contractors. So uh, Hunt Electric was the, the biggest contractor in town that I called on. And then about 2000. Uh, 
2005 is when I started calling primarily on consulting engineers. And uh, along with that, I, I deal with some industrial end users and uh, uh, people who have questions on, okay, here's what I want to do. Tell me how that translates to the real world of how you can manufacture this kind of stuff. So I, I try and set a balance between what customers want or need and what companies like Eaton can manufacture. And we try to make a nice little cost-effective blend. Just kind of to get a feel, how many people here have worked recently or are working now at, the, at a contract or Hunt or Parsons, any of those? The couple back there, how about anybody at a consultant right now? Who are you with? Okay. How about um, anybody, a, uh, an electrician, field electrician, or a master electrician, or anything like that? That too? Okay. Okay. So we got a little mix here. Um, with that said, then, I think this, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, what I'll do is I'll kind of uh, show where we are in the main distribution system. And, uh, you know, starting from the generator station where, you know, power basically gets made or created or put into usable form, you're at about uh, 11 to 25 kV. And then they put it over to a station switch yard, which actually steps it up to 69,000 all the way up to, say, 700 kV. And that's the transmission that you see on the big power lines that roll uh, across the city. And then you get down into the distribution substation where it drops down to usable power. And there's kind of three different areas or segments we, uh, we like to look at. The industrial companies, most of them will, will take what we consider medium voltage. Okay, so an industrial load of medium voltage is 2,400 volts all the way up to 35 kV. Usually, or your most common voltages are 5 kV or 15 kV. 15 kV is a very cost-effective means to distribute the power. 5 kV, you can actually, um, is usable power. There's a lot of motors, chillers, HVAC stuff that runs off 5 kV. One of the reasons uh, either big buildings or big uh, industrials use 5 kV, obviously, is there's some cost efficiencies. You don't have to step down the voltage. Every time you step down the voltage, you're running it through a transformer. When you go through a transformer, what do you get? Energy losses. Okay, a transformer itself, when it sits there without doing anything, there's no load connected, it's using power just to basically create a magnetic field. And, you know, roughly, um, you know, you may be talking a, a transformer that's 90, uh, you know, 98% efficient, 80, 95% efficient, and, and all that. That difference is basically just uh, flushed away money. So you're buying energy that you're not using. So that's one of the reasons this is a very cost effective one. They're buying the energy and they're using everything they're buying. Uh, down at the end of the line is your residential load. So any of your housing neighborhoods, usually you'll see that green transformer that drops it down to say a 120, 240, or some type of single phase throughout your uh, uh, out your neighborhood. And what we're gonna look more closer at today is this what they call a commercial load. And there's really two main voltages that you're going to see in light commercial or medium commercial uh, uh, distribution. Um, 480, 277 is a very common, vo common voltage and 208, 120 is the other most common voltage. In addition you can actually have single phase loads in that type of facility as well. So UL looks at that, and when, when we make um, distribution equipment, UL kind of guides us on what we can do. So they have a, a standard set of voltages that they will recognize uh, as a UL uh, recognized system voltage. And the 208Y or the 480 volt Y, I mentioned, you know, you can also have the deltas, 240, 480 volt, or even 600 uh, volt delta. And that's a three-phase three-wire. Now, 600 volts, who actually uses anything over 480 volts? Has anybody seen that? If you go up to Canada, they actually use 575 volts. You know, that's their, uh, you know, one of their standard voltages. Uh, if you get into data centers, you see a lot of research now. When I talk about the higher voltage, the better efficiencies you're going to get through a system. Data centers now, which are very 
you know, one of the largest uses of powers in power in the country. And, and you know, think, think along the lines of uh, like a Google. If you can imagine how many computer servers they have under roofs that are like the size of football fields scattered around the country. And all these things are are big um, power users. They just pull in power, not just to run the computers, but what do computers do? Computers generate heat. So you have to have some, you know, massive... Uh, cooling system set up in those facilities. So in the future, you know, maybe five years uh, or so, I fully expect you're going to see higher voltages being used in data centers. Maybe not 575, but, uh, um, uh, you know, definitely higher than what you're seeing somewhere around that voltage. And your single phase voltage is 120-240 around there as well. And you all actually recognize the DC voltage, which is your 125 or 250 volt DC. So your primary distribution, you know, every type of system is going to look something like this, where you've got a, uh, a transformer that's at the beginning, which is what's stepping it down to your usable voltage, and some kind of disconnect in front of that, and that may be owned by the facility, it may be owned by the utility. And then starting at this point is your distribution switchboard. And uh, uh, for purposes of today, we're going to then basically talk in 600 volts or less. So we'll say that's a 480 volt switchboard. And that's really the, uh, the main point of the system inside of a building, which then can go to different distribution panels, lighting panels, dry type transformers that step it down to 208 volts, um, motor control centers, etc. Now, there's two main purposes of a distribution system. Uh, the first main purpose is to distribute the power, and the second one is to protect your loads. So when you're talking about distributing the power, there's two main factors on what you're trying to accomplish in your distribution. Number one, uh, I'm going to say number one is to deliver it safely. And nobody wants to see a fire or an unsafe situation. Um, you know, it's getting a lot more visibility today. So distribution systems have to be safe. And number two, and maybe this is uh, as important for the guys with the checkbooks, is you need to do it economically. So when you design a system, if you're a consultant designing a system or a contractor doing a design and build, um, you need to design it such as you're maximizing uh, or minimizing the cost, which maximizes either the profit or the money in the pocket for the owner that he can do other things uh, with, you know, more cost effective things with. And uh, from the safety side, you know, you're talking about protecting your loads. And we're talking loads, you could be protecting motors, you could be protecting um, light fixtures, uh, you could be protecting receptacles, and uh, often overlooked, but, you know, one of the main causes of fire is you're protecting the cables that feed this equipment, the cable that feeds the motor, the cable that feeds the light. A lot of times when you're talking a, uh, a, a fire that happens and burns down a building and they come in and they do a little triage, <laughs> You hear a lot of stories about, well, they found a frayed wire. Somebody was putting this copper tubing up here and pounding a nail, frayed a wire, and it's been arcing for a while. And that arc gradually builds up over time and finds a path to a, a short circuit, and, and that's how a fire starts behind a wall off. Um, so two types of... Um, Failures that can occur are broken down into overloads and short circuits. Does anybody know what an overload can be defined as? It's a very, it's basically like if you've got a uh, receptacle in here with a 20 amp circuit breaker where you're just going to plug your computer in. And I plug in this search strip with the whole class's computers plug in, and I'm running continuously 22 amps coming off of a 20 amp circuit. That's fine, and it's going to run for a while to handle that, that overload. But eventually, over time, it's going to trip because it's recognizing you're drawing too much on the circuit. 
Uh, the second part, and this is where the dangerous part comes in, is the, uh, is the short circuit failures. So when a short circuit uh, occurs, a short circuit is, is a higher current in a shorter time duration. So that's the difference between an overload and a short circuit. Overload, very little current over a longer period of time. Short circuit, high spike of current over a very short period of time. And, you know, the distribution system is responsible for protecting when these two events are kind of, when these two events occur. Uh, you know, so just take a couple pictures of just some different types of faults. Um, your line to neutral um, is a common type of fault. And, you know, that's a typical circuit breaker in a, say, C phase seems to come close to the neutral, whether it's a couple cables touching or something in the wall. Uh, that is one type of fault. You can go a line-to-line -line fault. You can go a line-to-line -line and a neutral fault, and all types of faults can occur. And the last one here is a three-phase fault. And uh, another way you may hear that phrase is a bolted fault, a three-phase bolted fault. And which one of these, which one of these kind of looks like it might be the worst condition? The three-phase bolted fault. So that's your worst case scenario. Three phases touching together, basically can, creating a continuous loop of current with no resistance. Um, and current your resistance and current, you know, kind of go up and down. So if you got very little resistance, you'll have a lot of current, very high resistance, and you'll lower the current. So with very, very low resistance, you got a very high current. When you design an electrical distribution system, uh, code is requiring that you have to design it for the worst case scenario, which is the three phase bolted fault. Now, in a real world fault, there's always going to be some type of resistance, whether it's a little air or a little insulation on a conductor or uh, you know, any type of number of things can put a little resistance in the circuit and, and, and likely lessen the magnitude. But uh, and if you look, think about a three-phase bolted fault, think about you're installing a panel board and you've got your wrench in there and you're tightening and checking all your connections and you just happen to leave your wrench sitting right across the A, B, and the C phase across the bus and you shut the cover and you go and you flip the switch and you basically got a dead connection between all three phases and that will propagate very quickly and you will you will not just hear it you'll see it you'll smell it it will be a failure but that's what we need to design our systems for and when i talked about the three three phase bolted faults uh, what that will produce in that scenario is what they call a maximum fault current or the maximum short circuit current that's going to be available. And it's going to depend on the available fault current from the power company and the impedance of the system at the point of the fault. NEC actually requires that all the devices have to be rated for the short circuit current available at their terminals. And I'm going to put an asterisk on that because we're going to circle back to that. There's one at the bottom there. And uh, UL specifies that the short circuit current of uh, the assembled panel boards or switchboards uh, can't exceed the rating of the lowest device. So basically everything that you make has to be rated to withstand your maximum fault current. Okay, and the fault current, um, you know, I mentioned it's going to be driven by two things. Number one is the power company. So if, um, if I'm up by the uh, by the Excel plant, and I've got a, a building I'm building right next to the cell for Excel plant, and they're kicking power right next door, running a cable over to my place. Uh, with a very big transformer, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of fault current available, so your system's probably gonna have to be designed pretty rigorous. If I happen to be out in the uh, you know, an hour out of town, I don't have a substation nearby, they put a little transformer in there, I got a lot of cable in between. Uh, you may not have a lot of fault current available from that utility. The second part is the impedance in the system. I'm just going to bounce back a couple pages here. When I talk about impedance in the system, okay, I'm taking my utility service here. 
And at what point will you see your largest fault current? Which pieces of these equipment do you expect to have the largest, the maximum, lar the highest value of maximum fault current? Switchboard distribution panels, lighting panels. Distribution switchboard. And why would that be? Very short path, very little resistance. Okay, when you think resistance, think about a cable. Cables are made up of copper on the inside, insulation on the outside, and all the electrons that have to run through that cable with the current, the ones in the middle, they go very quick. The ones on the outsides are bumping into the insulation as they're coming through and it's slowing them down. So the cable itself is going to you know, basically lessen the fault current the more cable you use. Pardon? Um, yes. Yeah, it, well, they will generate eddy currents because, yeah, your current's flowing through there. Um, so your distribution switchboard here is going to feed these different panels down here. And, you know, the closer this is to the distribution switchboard, the shorter your cable is, the higher your fault current is going to be. And in a typical design, if I start out at 65,000 amps, very common uh, rating to start out with. So if I start out at 65,000 amps at my distribution switchboard, I'm going to feed a distribution panel and just this cable here may knock that down to 25,000 amps. Uh, this one's 50,000 amps. Now if these are the same, these two distribution panels are the same distribution, you know, same cables feeding them. One of them's in the electrical equipment room right next to the switchboard and one of them's 100 yards down in the next uh, next equipment room, this one's 25, this one's 50, which one of these two panels left or right is the one that's in the main electrical equipment room next to the switchboard? Left or right? Right. This one here. How can you tell? Higher fault current, shorter distances. Okay, then we got an oddball here. We got a dry type transformer feeding the lighting panel. This may be in the electrical equipment room too, and notice this one is only listed as 4,800 amps. Why, how can that be so low? Got a dry type transformer. I'm stepping it down from 480 to 208. And what's a dry type transformer? It's built in impedance or resistance in a dry type transformer. You know, you think about the core and the coils that are right next to each other, but there's actually air in between. So I'm spinning, I'm applying voltage on one side and I'm inducing voltage on the other side and there are not really any cables connecting. So dry type transformers have a built-in impedance, typically around 4%, 5% impedance. And what that's going to do is put a fixed number of, a uh, fixed amount of short circuit current that can actually come out of the secondary of that transformer. And it's gonna be tied to the KVA or basically the full load amps that that transformer is designed um, to output. All right, that's kind of just some general stuff. So now let's uh, let's move into uh, a little bit of discussion on panel boards. We've got a. I'm just going to talk a little bit some general on the panel boards, and uh, and then we'll kind of get into the Eaton panel boards themselves. So a panel board it is a wall mounted electrical power distribution device for use in commercial and industrial applications. It's the circuit control and the overcurrent protection for heat, light, or power circuits. So when I say circuit control, I mean a circuit breaker. If you ever need to work on it or turn anything, turn anything on or off, it's just basically an on-off switch. And then the overcurrent protection, there's two types of overcurrent protection. Number one, short circuit. Number two, overload. All right, so a panel board is going to come in, in, uh, in basically three components. Number one is the box. All this is a sheet steel. Sheet steel bent with basically formed into a box with one side cut off. 
Uh, the next component of a transformer is the chassis. And this is really um, the meat and the potatoes of the Phantomboy. So they, they basically take some rails, you mount the, the bus on it, you get everything bolted together, and with your A, B, and the C copper bus in there, you put circuit breakers um, mounted top to bottom with the breakers or main lines or what have you in there. And everything basically that you need in that transformer is included on the chassis. So the chassis basically just takes it and mounts it directly on the back fan of this box. Once it's installed um, and everything's wired up, you mount the trim. And the trim is again another piece of sheet steel. Now it's going to be painted, um, you know, because that's what's going to stick out and that's going to be the, uh, the you know what you see and what people interact with when they access when they access this. When you see a normal trim, you see there's a, a little door on the inside. So you'll bolt the connections all the way around the outside, which bolts into the outer edges of the panel board, and then you can access a little door uh, on the inside with a uh, a lockable or like the ability to be lockable handle right on the front. And what they call this is a dead front. So this trim, this door here actually covers right about here. And what that allows it to be is a dead front. So when you open that door, you see the circuit breakers, but you're not exposed to any of the wiring or any of the connections. Why do they do that? See. Three types of chassis you can have. And it's going to depend on your design and the cost uh, that you want to incur on your, uh, in your system. Number one is main lugs. Uh, the second one is a main circuit breaker, and the third one is a main fusible switch. So for all practical purposes, the main circuit breaker and the main fusible switch are the same type of design. You're putting some kind of overcurrent protective device to protect the chassis and the feeder breakers. Same thing, that could be a fuse to protect the chassis and the feeder breakers. Okay, your main lugs only has the chassis and the feeder breakers, but you've got no circuit breaker protecting in it. You've just got lugs where you can land your cable. So what actually protects this panel board? Panel board is only rated for 225 amps. What protects it from seeing more than 225 amps? Coming from, that's correct. Something upstream. Yeah. So upstream, you got these cables coming from, say, a switchboard somewhere that's coming in to, to feed this main lug only panel, and you would have your 225 amp breaker in your switchboard, 225 amp cables that feed this main lug only chassis, which is then all protected from the breaker upstream in the switchboard. Now, when you're designing a system, which one would common sense tell you would be the more cost-effective design? Main lugs or main break? Main lugs, because these cost money. Okay, that's much cheaper just to put lugs in there. So from a cost-effective standpoint, main lugs is, uh, is the way to go. Now, from the convenience standpoint, if I'm an electrician and, uh, you know, I've got panels throughout my buildings, what do I want to see? I want to see some kind of disconnect in the panel, so if I need to work on a breaker, or change out a breaker, I can walk up to my panel, turn the breaker off right there, versus having to walk to the switchboard, which may be in the basement or on the floor below, and having to turn that breaker off, lock it out, tag it out, before I can come work on this panel. Um, when you order a panel board, you can get it either top feed or bottom feed. And uh, when the manufacturers like us make these panel boards, we build it that way. So it is important that when you order panel boards, you always know whether you're going to feed it from the top or you feed it from the bottom. And we're going to put that breaker or the lugs on the right side.
there's two types of trims, and this also applies to, to panel board boxes as well, but two types of installation on how you're going to do a panel board. Number one is surface, and the second one is flush. So when you're talking a surface-mounted panel board, all you're talking is you're taking that five and a half inch deep box, you're bolting it to the outside of the wall, so it's sticking out five inches, and then you take a trim and you just bolt it, it mounts right around there, so everything sticks out from the wall. When you're talking flush, you are basically mounting a panel board inside the wall. So it, it, uh, if you're thinking about your house, they make load centers uh, smaller. Those load centers in your house are designed to conveniently the exact width of studs. So they slide right into the studs and you just put a nice cover right over there. And the cover is flush with the wall, so when you walk up, I think you used to have one here, yeah. Walk up, it's just like this. Nothing sticks out. Very safe situation. And this is another one that's important for the manufacturer to know this going in because on a flush trim, it's the same trim, but they actually extend it out about an inch and a half, uh, give or take, than a normal one. So you can overlap that space where the, maybe the drywall and the can hit. So you're uh, your drywall guy doesn't have to be 100% device and pretty it up and stuff. He can keep it a little bit rough, and the trim takes care of the uh, aesthetics to make it usable or functional in a room like this. Two of the common features that you'll hear uh, uh, people request on panel board trims are what they call concealed trim clamps, fast trim, um, or door and door. Now the fast trim or the concealed clamps, if you can see this one a little bit, there's these, uh, the trim actually bolts, and it's not off full section, the trim actually bolts to the can all the way around, and then you can open the door, small door on the inside to get the breakers. What the fast concealed trim clamps does is it takes all those screws out of the out of the picture. Now why would you want to do that? Because then with the screws out, the only way you can get in is to access through this uh, lockable device. So, you know, whether it's a prison or a school, there's a lot of reasons why you want to do your best to limit the access for somebody else getting into that panel board. You know, a lot of them it's just a simple uh, um, you might even have a mall where you've got an access hallway that, that you know goes to the restrooms in the mall and that happens to be where you got to put one of your panel boards and this is a great way to be able to make it uh, um, much more difficult to get in there and get access to that stuff. The other type of special trim is the door in the door. Now the door in the door what this does is, is you notice uh, on the side here is a hinge. So you can still bolt your sides here, but you can take, if you undo these bolts, you can open the door right here. So you've got the whole, you got the little door that can open up, and then you got the big door that can open up. And why is two doors, what would you, why, why would two doors be useful? What's the benefit of that? Accessibility. Accessibility. So think about a contract contractor who's uh, uh, installing a uh, installing a panel board and over you know maybe a couple of days or so he mounts the panel board puts it on the wall and he's running all his lights and his receptacles back to this panel board and everything he's wiring through and he's connecting it uh, it's taking time he'll connect it he'll make sure it's connected he'll go to the next one he'll connect all these wires well he ain't gonna, he ain't gonna do it non-stop He's going to have a coffee break. He's going to have a lunch break. He's going to have an afternoon break. He's going to go home at the end of the day, come back and finish it the next day. OSHA is very strict now on making sure panel boards are covered. And, you know, you used to always see a, uh, uh, you know, the, a plastic uh, protector that people would put over there or a piece of cardboard that was very common to cover the currents because when the electrician and he puts something, uh, he's got that energized to make sure his load's hooked up. His loads aren't exactly in the same room. He may have to walk over to the next room. So if he's got his panel board energized, he's locked in the next room to make sure his load's connected. 
his buddy walks in, you know, every, if everything's exposed, it's a very dangerous situation that OSHA uh, frowns upon. So there's been a lot of fines recently and, and uh, warnings that you know, make sure panel boards are covered and never left exposed. So the door in the door is a very low cost and easy way for a contractor to have that always covered. He can shut the door, put a couple screws in, and leave. Now what Eden did um, is we took these two concepts, the most popular uh, features that were requested apart from a standard trim, and we designed it in what we call a, uh, an easy trim. This was kind of a uh, industry leader, uh, must be about five years ago, a little more than that by now. Uh, we took that trim and we made concealed hardware standard. We made door and door standard. And, you know, we don't require any tools to mount it. And it installs in, uh, it says less than 20 seconds versus five minutes. Now, a normal trim, you got to put it up there and you got to put some screws in. And the really big ones might take two guys, but. Um, takes a little bit of time to put it on there. An easy trim mounts with no tools and no hardware. So what the trim does, the key is in this little tab here, and the trim itself, you basically, it's got these tabs here, 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 and here, and you set the bottom tab of this trim on the corresponding notch of the panel board box and, and you just basically kind of lift it up and set it down and it locks into place and the whole door then can swing open and close. And we had this at the, uh, had a demo of this easy trim at the Midwest Expo, must be uh, five, six years ago now. And we set it up to see, you know, how long, what contractors thought about it and how long they could mount it and stuff. And uh, we gave away prizes, and uh, more than one person is able to inst were able to install trims in under eight seconds. I think six seconds was the winner, if I'm not mistaken. And if you have a contract and you've worked in the field, and you think about how much time you can save, which means you can do a little bit more, you can have that extra sandwich on break or what have you. You just free up a little bit of time to get a little bit more done. So we're getting very positive feedback on that trim. Um, when a panel board uh, needs to be uh, more than one section or more than one box, uh, there's two different ways you can kind of attack that animal and how you put these two boxes together. Now, I'll start out with NEC. I don't know if you guys, anybody know NEC uh, now allows more than 42 circuits in a panel board. In the old days, NEC on lighting and receptacle panels limited you to 42 circuits. So if you had more than that, you would stack panel boards alongside of each other to get all the circuits you need. Now NEC um, allows you to basically go to the maximum available, and that for us, that's 84 circuits, all under one panel board. Um, it can save you in some costs, some installation costs. It can help save a little room in the uh, in the electrical equipment room. You know, the downside that I've always seen is, you know, 21 breakers on each side with 21 wires. There was plenty of room in a panel board for that. But now if you're doubling that and you got 42 breakers on each side running up the gutters, you can get a little, uh, yeah, you can get a little crowded in there. So that, that's one of the downsides. A lot of times maybe you just want to make the panel board a little wider, which is an option or standard widths on a panel board are 20 inches wide, um, but you could get it up to 28 inches wide if you'd like. So if you do have multi-section panels, you can use sub-feed lugs or through-feed lugs as a way to feed that. So sub-feed lugs, um, basically... Your incoming cables would come here. You would have two panels side by side. This first panel would be main lugs only, where it's basically a dual set of main lugs. The second lug would basically be used to feed over here. So you've got no main breaker. Your main breaker has to be upstream from the switchboard. And both panels uh, are fed from the same source. 
and it just looks like this. Instead of one cable where you land on your, this is your AB and your C bus, you got room for two cables on your AB and C bus. And you always put them on the same side. It's a nice easy daisy chain back and forth. And for aesthetic purposes, um, usually you'll make both of these panel boards the same height so they sit right next to each other. Looks a little better. Now the second way is through feed locks. Now this one's a little different. Um, the main can be main lugs only or a main breaker because you're not you're only landing one cable here. You're feeding through and putting your lugs on the other side to feed your second panel. Uh, so the benefit is gives the option of putting a main breaker. Now if you use the main breaker here in this design, why didn't I say you can use a main breaker here? I'm saying you have to use main lines only. Because main breakers don't quite have the capability to fit that extra set of cables in here. You're limited to the breaker and how many cables you can fit in there. And circuit breakers are designed uh, really only for the cables that carry the amperage of the circuit breaker. You won't find a circuit breaker where you can basically double up your cables on. And here's what your through feed lugs will look like. It's almost an invertible panel, lugs on both sides. You could have breaker there and lugs there. Uh, panel board sizes, uh, you know, NEC now taking away the 42 circuit rule. The only thing that limits uh, how many breakers, how big we can make a panel board is how many breakers we can fit in a standard box. I mentioned you can go wider, you can go 28 inches wide, but there's a height um, restriction that's going to come into play more, most often. And uh, NEC has a requirement that the operating handle of the top most breaker uh, can be no more than six foot seven above the finished floor. So no matter how many breakers you can fit in, that top breaker can't be more than six foot seven. Makes it, uh, in theory, they make it so you can always get to that breaker and turn it off. Probably no problem for me, but I've seen some electricians who aren't the tallest in the world, and six foot seven doesn't work for them as much as seven foot seven does. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the two codes, then the uh, you know these are all the the industry standards for panel boards, and, and I guess the one thing to take away from this is that UL is the standard for manufacturers to manufacture the product. They tell us what to do. They look in, you know, this has to be this way, you have to pass this test, and then you can put a UL sticker on our panel board. It happens to be UL 67 for panel board. NEC, the National Electric Code, doesn't have any bearing on how we put together our product. It is a code uh, about how that product is installed. So NEC is an installation code. UL is more like a manufacturer's code. Now, granted, we understand the NEC is driving how this is going to be installed. So we do consider we do consider that when we make our design to make sure we're not putting something in that vi that's going to violate the NEC if it's installed properly. And NEMA uh, is basically us and our competitors. Uh, getting together in a room and making sure there's a set of standards that everybody uh, plays by, playing the rules, um, putting in new ideas, uh, sometimes new UL codes or what have you. I didn't mention this, but uh, you know I mentioned Eaton uh, as a manufacturer for electrical distribution equipment. Are you guys familiar uh, with the other manufacturers of electrical distribution equipment? I always think there's four in the United States that are, uh, I would consider, major manufacturers. Square D? Cutler Hammer. GE. Cutler Hammer's Eaton. Yep, Eaton. Eaton, Cutler Hammer, and Siemens. Um, when you're looking at a market or a market share leaders, uh, depending on what product you're talking about, generally Eaton and Square D are number one or number two in the market share for the different products. Um, GE and Siemens, uh, I'll call them 
battling for third or fourth, depending on you know what product you're talking about. And out of all those four manufacturers, uh, I guess one of those companies has all their manufacturing plants in the United States, has their headquartered in, headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and is very proud to say they're a made in the USA and, and headquartered and profited in the USA company. And then A squared E, that's, uh, that's E. So we're, uh, you know, we do work, a lot of work with the federal government and, uh, you know, on the energy efficiency things. I don't know if you guys, uh, anybody's got a plug-in hybrid car yet, but uh, if you plug in your car, there's uh, standards that were just developed you know, over the last five or ten years, and Eaton was a big part of that, and Eaton car chargers, the electrical vehicle chargers. Um, there's a couple of companies out there where we make them. Uh, but we're very involved in uh, being a United States company, we can help from that regards with the government type stuff. Any general questions as of now before we get into some product specific stuff? Uh, I will say yes, we're putting them in. And I would say nobody's really using them yet. Uh, you know, and this is kind of the chicken and the egg thing. You can't buy an electrical car unless you got a place to charge it. You can't put a charger in and make money or anything until you get cars to plug in. So, you know, I think the government kind of did a good thing. Some of this was stimulus money. A lot of it is uh, just other R&D money. Um, but uh, places around town, I believe, you know, down at the state capitol in that area, you'll see some electric chargers. Um, I think you see one or two at the Mall of America. You'll see them at state fairgrounds and some of the other federal and municipal buildings. We're starting to add them. Yeah, I mean, do you have to pay for them? You know, everyone gets your own. Your, the, the chargers are set up where the owner, whoever puts it in, can really dictate how you want to do it. So there's a couple different ways. You can just have it free. So things like a, uh, you know, you will see them in front of the Walmarts or in front of the Cub Foods. And where you can go in and plug your car and go and shop and come back. And those places, more than likely, you're going to be able to do that for free because they're going to watch you and they're going to get your 100 bucks one way or the other. Um, in places like uh, the city, I think it was in their, uh, you know, they've got a fleet of cars. And the city, this is St. Paul, has a fleet of cars. They're moving to electrical, you know, and they're not just going to dump their cars, but as they replace or upgrade their fleet of um, city vehicles, they'll get electric cars. So those electric cars will be able to charge, no charge in that fleet. And what the city does is when you, when you go and you pull your truck car up and you're going to charge it, you get like a key fob, you know, whether you wave it or you plug it in or hit a three-digit number, and you don't get charged, but it keeps track of how many kilowatts, your kilowatt hours you're, you're, down, you're using to charge your car. Um, the third one, and this is the one you see in, in California. Now, California is much farther ahead of us uh, in, in Oregon and Washington as well. We're, we are not leading the company country by any means. Uh, but out in California, they've actually got the charging stations uh, set up between, I think it's like Sacramento and San Francisco, like a gas station. And this is the, this is the end road. So if you look out 10, 20 years from now, you'll see uh, there'll be gas stations where you'll have three, four gas pumps and three or four chargers. So this one in California, you pull up and uh, they call them quick chargers. And a lot of it's going to depend on you charging with DC, which you can do in a half hour or 20 minutes, or you're charging with 120 or 240 volt AC, which could take 48 hours, four to eight hours. Uh, so in California, you pull in, you swipe your credit cards, just like you're filling with gas, you charge it up, you go in and have a cup of coffee, and you come back out in 20 minutes and you're on your way. So it's really, it can, it can vary, all depending on who puts it in and whether you're paying for it or whether it's free or whatever. Good question. All right, so uh, just touching then on uh, some of our uh, panel board products. Uh, you know, basically, 
break panel boards down into two different types. There's the lighting and the receptacle panel. These are your 4277, your 12208 type loads. And there's your power panels. Power panel boards are uh, like a, a mini switchboard. You've got larger circuit breakers that you may be feeding motors with or you may be feeding multiple panels with, kind of a, a midpoint. When you, uh, and I'm going to give you this presentation uh, to load up, but this is probably the biggest takeaway on what information you need to be able to price a panel board or for us to be able to price or manufacture a panel board. Always need to know the service, the voltage, and the frequency. So is it, you know, four wire or three wire, 480 volt, 208 volt, 60 hertz, is it going to the United States? And the main ampere rating, whether that's main lugs or main breaker, or main fusible switch, 225 amp, 400 amp. Short circuit current rating, that's the one most often forgot or tried to be overlooked. But again, when we talked about all uh, the devices, have to be rated to withstand uh, the maximum available fault current at that point in the distribution system. We need that information to be able to do that. Then you need to define your branch circuits. So you've got one full, two full, three full breakers. 20 amps, 50 amps, 100 amps, what do you need? Uh, the environment. This room's a pretty good environment. No issues whatsoever. Of course, if I'm taking a panel board and I'm putting it outside, I want it on the garage, maybe to, to feed some outside equipment down by the shop. Well, that's a whole different environment. Um, in here would be classified as NEMA 1. Outside would be classified as NEMA 3R. Uh, another option you see is in wastewater, water wastewater treatment plants. They will have distribution panels and water wastewater plants. Well, what's going on in water wastewater? It's nothing but you take the uh, you take the waste and you make a big pool of it and you throw all kinds of chemicals in there to kind of clean it up. Well, those chemicals create the fumes that are in the air, and those fumes that are in the chem from the chemicals don't mesh well with copper. So your copper within a couple of years could end up being a green and white chalky substance that is just counting down to failure. So we need to know that because we can manufacture uh, panel boards in different ways. For cop for the bus bars, the solution is we can actually tin plate uh, the copper. Tin is a great, uh, uh, tin doesn't act the same way as normal copper does in that environment. For the enclosure itself, a normal painted steel uh, can get very corrosive. You could also have the option to get a panel board in what they call a NEMA 4 or a NEMA 4X, which is going to be a plastic or a stainless steel type enclosure that's not going to be harmed by the environment. Uh, another one is actually if uh, maybe you've got a gravel pit and you've got some big equipment and you got a little house out by the gravel pit that uh, um, you got uh, you need a panel board for for some distribution and the gravel pit you know obviously it's kicking up dust non-stop everything's dusty at the end of the day there seems to always be a thin layer of something we've got an enclosure that is classified as NEMA 12 dust type and that's basically puts gaskets around where the openings are and that keeps some of the dust out makes it last week. you figure dust and uh, electricity go well together not at all. Dust, you know, electricity. When you all tells us how we build panel boards, they'll say you need to build that those bus bars two inches apart. So when we build our panel board, those bus parts are bus bars are two inches apart. That two inches is air in between there. Air is a pretty good insulator. But all of a sudden, if you take that air and you put dust particles in there, that's given that electricity a little bit better path to go from one hot from one to the other. It's like grain silos exploding. Same concept. Yep. yep. And you wonder why, you know, and I, that's a perfect example of what can happen and 
you can't always do everything about it, but you have to do your best to minimize that risk. When things explode, you know, it's one thing to say, uh, yeah, my silo's down, my insurance covers it, you know, covers it, so I'll have to, I'll be able to rebuild it, but, you know, that'll take uh, uh, three months for me to get that done. Uh, it's a whole other thing to say my silo blew up and my nephew happened to be standing at the bottom when it did. You know, so those are two things. It's kind of important to always consider that, obviously. Last one on the list was fully rated or series rated, which we'll, uh, we'll talk in a little bit more depth here. So short circuit rating is a combination of the two factors, um, and these are two terms that you hear in the industry, is the short circuit withstand rating of the chassis. And that means the maximum voltage fault current, maximum available that we uh, that we talked about, um, can be able to pump through this panel board without any damage. And the second one is the interrupting rating of the overcurrent devices, and that's a circuit breaker being able to interrupt that fault current. So think about withstand rating on a panel board or a circuit breaker. It's ability for the full rated maximum fault current to flow through that device and no damage is going to occur. Interrupting rating, you have that same fault current and you're talking about making a circuit breaker on the inside open up and interrupt that current. So on a 65,000 amp rated system, you could, number one, you got to get the panel board to be able to sit there for 65,000 amps for a few cycles. And number two, you have to design a circuit breaker that can literally separate 65,000 amps from flowing through there. When I talk separate, the inside of the circuit breaker, there's two contacts that are, that are forced together that open and close. When you're separating two contacts on the inside of a circuit breaker, what's going to happen? It's going to be an arc that follows. So when you first separate those, it does not clear instantaneously like it would be in a vacuum. It would clear instantaneously. Not in a vacuum, you're going to get a little arc that draws while those contacts separate. One of the things on the arc, um, one of the things, one of the ways that the arc helps is when the circuit breaker first starts to initiate a trip and starts to open, it may see uh, it's ramping up to 65,000. So if a fault occurs, the normal load is 100 amps, you're going to ramp your way up to 65,000 amps, or depending on how much impedance you have in the system. And somewhere, once you break um, uh, the point where the circuit breaker is going to trip, and maybe that's 1,000 amps as you're working your way up, the circuit breaker is going to tell itself to trip. The circuit breaker is going to start tripping. You're still feeding current into that fault. As those two contacts are starting to separate, you still got an arc, so your current's still flowing, but that arc between those two contacts is traveling through air. Air is a great impedance, so it, what it's going to do is actually going to stabilize it while the, uh, while the breakers finish opening. So there's an inherent current limiting factor uh, built into circuit breakers that are going to help interrupt that. Uh, you know, maybe this is a good time. I don't have slides on this, but uh, on a circuit breaker itself, you guys know how a circuit breaker works? I know when I started with my company, I didn't really know how a circuit breaker worked. Generally, you've got two kinds of a, you know, a circuit breaker. I'll just grab one of these. This is a 400 amp circuit breaker, just to give you some size. In. This is a 225 amp circuit breaker and a 400 amp circuit breaker. 400 amp circuit breakers is always when we start to have uh, an interchangeable pipe trip unit. So there's a circuit breaker, big frame, heavy molded case. And you know one of the reasons you do that is if you put 65,000 amps, you gotta have a lot of rigid, um, I'll call it engineered thermal resin composite plastic. Uh, holding this thing together so it stays in one piece while those contacts on the inside uh, separated. Um, so in this trip unit, 
here is the, the smarts or the intelligence that's telling when things should be taken offline and at what value they should be taken offline. There's two types of trip units. Number one is a solid state device. Not very cost effective in any of these smaller type breakers, but once you get up to, to 400 amp and larger, it's, uh, it's uh, more often than not, you'll have some type of solid state device. And what that does, you basically got CT's current transformers built inside the circuit breaker that always look at the current that's flowing through and make a decision, should it trip or should it not trip. Okay, so that's really looking at the signal. It's looking at the actual current, deciding what to do to set on the, you said, you know, you said depending on the value that, that it's reading. But the basic circuit breaker, whether it's these small ones, that circuit breaker in that load center, this is the same one for a panel board or even this 225 amp device. They have what is called the thermal magnetic trip unit. It's the standard trip unit, the lowest, most cost-effective trip unit. And functionally, it does what it says. It provides thermal protection and magnetic protection. Thermal magnetic circuit breaker. What is thermal protection? Thermal protection is overload protection. Thermal and overload. Thermal meaning an overload. Like if you plug it into the wall and you run it out over time and you run a little higher than what the rating is, whether the cable and the circuit breaker, you're going to gradually increase the heat. The heat, everything's going to get a little hotter before something tells the trip. What the circuit breaker is looking at, it's actually got two pieces of metal on the inside. Bimetal. There you go. It's a bimetallic type feel, type, uh, type system. So it's going to look, those two, those two pieces of metal have different coefficients of expansion. And when it gets too hot, one of them is going to bend and bend until it hits a trip bar that's going to tell this thing to trip. And that would be the, the thermal part, or the overload part of the trip unit. Now, the second part is the magnetic part. Now, the magnetic part is what deals with short circuit currents or higher value faults currents. The way the magnetic part works is um, be like a coil. The more, uh, it's the theory of magnetics, the, uh, the more current's going through, the higher of a magnetic current you're going to generate, and the more that coil is going to move, and when you hit a certain value, you're going to create enough magnetic coil, or a magnetic magnetism, if that word's right, uh, to activate that coil and move it into the trip bar. So your thermal overload, your thermal is a slow speed over time again, and your magnetic part, high short circuits, quick speed. Any questions on how the circuit breaker works? Um, getting back into the uh, into what we had then is. Uh, when you're talking about panel panel boards, I mentioned a fully rated system or a series rated system. Yep. Are we doing the split the brace? Yeah, good time. Yep. Split the brace for the first like five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank yep. You break through. Okay. Let's go ahead and. Uh, Get you up and running again, view, and full screen it. Okay, fully weighted and series weighted panels. All right. Uh, two types of protection systems for uh, low voltage panel boards. Your most common, and I'll call it your default value, or your default method is fully rated protection. Fully rated is when all your overcurrent devices are rated for the full perspective short circuit current, the maximum short circuit current, at their line side terminals. Uh, panel board rating is equal to the lowest rating component in the panel. Um, series rated is a short circuit interrupting rating assigned to a combination of two or more overcurrent devices connected in series which the rating of a downstream device in the combination is less than the series rating. A lot of words, and what does this actually mean? 
a fully rated panel board. Uh, if I'm looking at a situation where I've got 65,000 amps available fault current, my main breaker and all my feeder breakers have to be rated to withstand 65,000 amps. In a series rated system, what uh, talked about two breakers in series, so what, uh, what this means is I'm still using my 65,000 amp main breaker, but I'm using 10,000 amp AIC feeder breaker. Now, how can I do that is because, as a manufacturer, I take these two breakers and I put them on a bench in front of UL and I test them and I say, if I have a fault current on the load side of this one, one of these two breakers will trip. Either this one or this one. I don't care which, as long as one of those two trips and the panel board remains intact and everything can uh, get back up and going once the fault is cleared. Now this circuit breaker here, the same size, form, fit, function is available in 35,000 amps uh, AIC, a 65K AIC, or 100K AIC. Same exact breaker. So if I'm laying out a panel board, and I got three of these breakers, which one do you suppose is going to be the most expensive? 100K. And the 65K, and the most cost effective, the 35K. So if I'm designing a system, remember the couple of main goals, one of them was make it economical. Which of these two methods is probably going to be the most economical? Your series rating. On all these breakers, you're able to save money. Now, just kind of the points, I, I probably mentioned these, but uh, the series ratings are tested combinations that's underlined in that this has to be approved by UL. We can't just say there are two breakers in series. Upstream always has the uh, higher rating than the downstream. And, um, you know, one of the things is the upstream device may be the main circuit breaker in the panel board, or in the case of a main lug only panel board, it can be the upstream switchboard breaker that feeds that panel board. As long as it's the first breaker directly upstream, you're just fine. And we have those for fuses too. So, uh, you know, here's kind of the, uh, the two methods. Here's your panel board with branch breakers, main breaker included there. Take that same breaker, make this main lugs only, and move that upstream breaker into the switchboard. And I picked a pretty good example here, but just to give you an idea of the cost ramifications, fully rated versus series rated. Look at a 225 amp main breaker, 65K AIC, three phase coil wire, 208 volts. I've got feeder breakers, a bunch of 20, 30 amp, one pole, two pole, three poles. And I'm doing a little cost estimate. Now I've got two different types of panels that I can use in this method. One panel, and notice both use the exact same main breaker, same price main breaker. These feeder breakers, which are all 65K rated, bring a panel board cost up to about 10 grand. That's a list. And series rated, I mean, where I had to use a GHB there, which is a 65,000 amp breaker, I can use a BAB, which is a 25,000 or a 10,000 amp breaker, and a much lower price. So my total panel board, panel board price is 5,000 versus 10,000. So series rating in this case is cutting my panel board price in half. Now, I mentioned list price. If you guys know how our uh, industry works, you know there's obviously a discount off that, but generally speaking, it's a two to one ratio. So you're half price on the panel board. And again, not to emphasize, overemphasize this, but these have to be UL listed. 
So in our consulting application guide, as well as our other catalogs, we publish these tables that say specifically what breakers are series rated. That same information and this yellow pamphlet goes in every panel board that we manufacture that's series rated. So when you open the pan, you got the directory, little plastic envelope in there. This book is going to be in that envelope. Five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road when somebody else comes in and they need to add a couple of circuit breakers, this, this manual will tell you, okay, I've got this main breaker. I can choose between these feeder breakers to maintain my series rate. Now, looking specifically at our uh, at our panels, we've got a a wide variety of panel boards. This is about uh, six of them, but we've probably got eight or ten different type of basic panel boards you can use. And notice they all they all increase in different voltages from 240, 40, 277, and a bunch rated 600 volts. And maximum rating, and this is the bus rating, the main lug rating, or the main breaker rating, from 400 amps to 600, 800, all the way up to 1200 amps. And the other driving factor of which panel board you're going to choose is the uh, branch circuit amperage. So these two are limited to a 100 amp maximum brass circuit, 225 amp branch circuit, or 1200 amp branch circuits. Now this is the big picture. Um, well, also, the one thing to uh, take into account is cable sizes. Um, when we make the main lugs and the sizes that we put these together, we follow pretty much uh, the NEC wire bending guidelines for the cables that are suitable for the amperages. And on every manufacturer, when we put together a drawing for a panel board, it will show you these are the cable, this is the cable size, and you'll have usually a range, you know, from uh, 3 aught to 250 KC mils or something like that. And you have to keep your cables inside that range. And there are sometimes options if you need to go one size bigger or so for voltage drop considerations, get a bigger, for a bit bigger cable, you can lessen your voltage drop. But it's not going to be an astronomical. You can't just choose any cable. So it's always important to look at the cable sizes to make sure what you're pulling in there matches or can fit with the panel board that you're using. There's been cases where somebody had a really long run and you had to get a larger rated panel board just to be able to fit in the cables because you need more space to bend those things. Um, and you go, everybody here know uh, on the NEC, I don't know if you've gotten an NEC yet, but there's a uh, cable sizing chart in there, and the cable sizing chart is different temperature ratings, and you've got a middle rating that's a 75 degrees C, and I think that's a general column that most of the contractors follow and the engineers follow. As a manufacturer, I, uh, I guess I can't emphasize enough, you have to use the middle 75 degrees C column. All of the lugs that are on all these circuit breakers and all the panel boards and all the switchboards, uh, everything is sized to the 75 degree C opacity column. So even if you have 90 degree C cable, you have to go across to figure out the opacity for 75 degree C column. Don't even ask because you can't get around it. Bob, do you make lugs in the local situation for 90 degree? Are you aware of? That's the question I was asked one time. It was in the media board. Yes. They have 90 degree. But we came across a panel board switch here that have lots that are rated for 90 degree. Um, circuit breaker or? Not, yeah, I'll, I'll click. Not on these mechanical type lugs that you see in these breakers. But I think there's compression lugs. So if you get like a big lug landing pad and a switch gear, a switchboard, you sh I think you can find a compression lug that carries a 90 degree C rating. Now the problem that we're going to tell you is that that lug's got to land somewhere, so you're going to bolt it into the rear compartment area of a switchboard onto a landing pad, a piece of copper, that's only sized and rated for 75. 
So you're still hitting the limitation, even if you can get the lug, you're still hitting the limitation of the landing pad. And the other thing that, you know, even if you use 90 degree C, C cable and a 90 degree C lug um, mounted in the back of a switchboard into a, or into a large panel board, that cable will generate more heat than a 75 degree C cable. It's rated for that. But the switchboard itself on the inside isn't tested to handle that excess heat. Now we could probably go through the rigors of testing it and all that, but I don't know if you ever dealt in anybody's experiences with UL, but it's very expensive and time consuming to test all the different configurations you can use to be able to expand these type of designs. And you know, just to throw out a number, it might be a million bucks testing costs to be able to come out with a one switchboard design that can handle a, a 90 degree C cable. Yeah, that's a question. Um, problem is on the motor side, it'll be, uh, you know, that may work on the motor side, but when you go back upstream again, I think you're going to run into the problem. You're going to have to connect it to something. And it's, it's across the industry. It's all the four major manufacturers. And, um, but you're not aware of any fleet here that has the rated for cables in the area low voltage. Correct. Okay. Now, you may, I, I guess I'll throw an asterisk, you may find uh, some OEMs. So, like somebody who does specific industry yeah. switch gear or switch boards. Gotcha. You know, maybe that's their niche is they've designed. A product that can do this, but from the major manufacturers, it doesn't exist. Okay. So walking through our, our uh, walking through our panel board family, then our power line one A is our most basic panel board. It's a two forty volt panel, four hundred amp maximum main line or main breaker, one hundred amp maximum branch break. Okay, this is a 100% maximum branch break right here, single pull or three pull. And that's the type of breakers, the little black ones. We kick probably a million of these off the manufacturing line a year or a day. We make these, tons of these things. Bob, before you leave this yep. one, this is the one that they're going to be using for the receptacle panel and the light panel. That's the stuff cheap they want. Yep. <clears throat> so this two that will cover a 4120. <clears throat> and does it cover the delta from 4122 or uh it doesn't it cover the delta. It covers mm -hmm. it says three oh yeah, take that back. It covers a two forty volt delta. Delta. Yes. And then the two eight one twenty. Two oh eight one twenty, three phase four wire with neutral is your two oh eight one twenty, your three phase three wire no neutral is your two forty volt delta. That would be your cup sheet there for the for the receptacle and the light. This kind of it says bolt on and plug on up here. I think we've kind of gotten rid of the plug on. So panel boards generally are all bolt on type circuit breakers, and we leave these load centers to be what you would use if you wanted a plug on break. And uh, one of the differences between wh why do we like bolt-on breakers versus plug-on breakers, me, I say as a manufacturer, and somebody who looks out for safety, you've got a hard bolted connection, as tight as you can make that bolt meeting the torque limits, is that firm connection. Loose connections generate heat. Heat generating leads to failure. Load centers and you're plugging stuff on, no matter how you construct it, you'll never get a tighter connection as a bolted connection. So, you know, load centers are used for lighter loads, you're fine. Lighter duty short circuit currents, you're fine. The heavier short current, short circuit currents you get, or the heavier loads you get, um, the more this is the only way you can do it with a bolted connection. All right, your panel boards look about this pretty generically here. You've got the panel board can on the outside, and you've mounted your chassis on the inside. And the only other things is we'll mount a neutral bar. We'll provide a loose 
you'll field mount that neutral bar in one gutter, and you'll field mount the ground bar in the other gutter. And then put a trim, I guess, over the front of all that. And one of the things, you know, that is uh, really came along in the industry is what they uh, call a surge protective device. Surge protective devices came on with the advent of uh, computers, or I should just say became much more popular and much more widely used with the advent of computers or solid state devices. Uh, solid state devices, you will see a lot of switching. Well, with transistors inside there, and this is probably a solid state class, and I know I didn't take solid state classes, but those transistors, each time you're firing transistors and you're doing that solid state stuff, you are messing with a voltage wave. Voltage wave is normally a nice, clean sine wave, positive and minus. When you get solid state de devices, whether it's a computer or a piece of test equipment or a Xerox copy machine or a fax machine, those solid state devices chop up and send these little transient voltages uh, into onto the waveform. They'll send it from the device back up the, the cables, back up to the main vent panel board where it can actually go infiltrate throughout the rest of your facility. So one of the things that you can do what people do at home um, to address that is put on uh, search strips. So just like what you see here, only you probably got one at your TV at home. The search strip does a different function as well. Number one, you prevent the voltage transients from going back up the line. And number two, uh, you can get an external voltage transient coming from outside the building into the building in your house. And what's the most common external voltage tra transient you probably see? Well, lightning strikes. Those are the ones that anybody know anybody who lost a TV or a household of TVs? If that lightning hits in your neighborhood, um, you're going to be in trouble. You could lose a lot of, a lot of household appliances because that follows, again, the path of least resistance. And lightning could be as high as uh, 200,000 amps. And if it hits the pole outside of your house, follows those electrical lines and those cables are just great conductors. So your telephone cables and she'll shoot right down in an instant into your house, uh, find its way very easily to the back of your TV. And all of a sudden the back of your nice, new expensive high definition TV uh, gets hit with a hundred thousand uh, amps or a, or a uh, 10 kV voltage spike or something like that. And those aren't built to take that. And that's why you'll see, if you read the warranty manuals for your TV, and I had to do this when I bought mine, it says in there, warranty is only valid when your TV is connected to a properly rated surge strip. And they'll tell you what the rating is. Otherwise, they won't even warrant it because that will lead to failure. So those two types of... of uh, what I'll call transient voltages. Number one, outside the building lightning. Number two, inside internally generated from fax machines, copy machines. What you see to address those is surge protective devices. Eaton's brand is the SPD series. Looks similar to this. We've got a little newer model here. But it looks, looks similar to this in, it looks like two breakers. Kind of stacked side by side, you know, one there and one there. And we do that for a reason, is because we can take this surge protective device and mount it right on the chassis like so it looks like two circuit breakers and then the bus bars go right into the back of this unit. Why is that any good? Why can't I just get a surge protective device and mount it next to my panel board and connect it to the panel? Every inch of wire from the surge strip to your bus is going to increase the left-through voltage of your SPD device. All these devices have certain left-through voltages. We test them and we publish them. Give or take on a 208 volt system or a 240 volt rated SPD, you're probably looking at uh, give or take five or 600 volts. Those are pretty small transients. Uh, 
And anything higher than that inside this, this SPD of a surge protector device, there's little MO, MOVs, uh, metal oxide barristers that open and close as soon as you break that threshold, it'll open and shunt all the current to ground until it goes away and then it'll shut and, and the normal current goes on through. So it cuts off, it chops off the top of the transient voltage. Correct. Yep. Just takes off the excess. Bleeds it off, I guess, is a good way to think about it. And it cleans up that voltage so it's usually within the design parameters of your load side equipment. So the key is if you put it on the panel board bus, it looks at things coming up, it looks at things coming down from the load or down from the lightning, and everything on that common bus will then have the cleaner type uh, voltage. So when I said every, uh, if you mount it external, every inch of cable that you mount between the bus bar and these MOVs increases the let through voltage by about 20 volts, give or take. So two feet of cable is going to increase your rating by two times uh, 24, 480 volts. And so your normal 600 volt unit is going to be a thousand volt unit. And so that's going to let in more transients. And that's why we're very strong proponents of direct bus bar mounting or incorporating your surge protective device right in the panel board itself. Contractor doesn't have to install it. Contract can't make any field installation errors. Um, it's guaranteed then to work. And these things come with 10-year warranties. There's not magic. You can probably sit out in your garage and make one of these. Maybe not the nice pretty display on it, but you could make. There's nothing uh, difficult about the insides of those. Um, Moving up into the next panel boards, the first one was power line ones, 240 volt, 400 amp maximum, 100 amp maximum feeder breakers. Very similar panel board is the power line 2A. Power line 2A basically steps her up to 480 slash 277. Same 400 amp max, same 100 amp max branch breakers. So the only difference between those two panel boards is it carries the 480 277 rating. And I'm going to point out it's got the three phase four wire with neutral rating, 4277. The only three phase three wire, no neutral rating, is for 240 volts. So this panel cannot be used on a 40 volt delta system. So between the power line 1A and the power line 2A, you're going to cover most of your actual, I'll call it building load, your lights. Your receptacles, 277 lights, 120 receptacles. Uh, that type of stuff is usually covered under these panel boards. When you go into your electrical closets that are scattered across these, you're going to usually see one of these two type of panels, the one of the power line one or the power line two. Now stepping up one more notch is the power line 3A panel board. The power line 3A is uh, a hybrid panel kind of between the lighting receptacle panels and the power panels. This adds the 480 volt delta ability. A little higher rating, 800 amp main lug, 600 amp main breaker. And it allows you to use 225 amp feeder breakers. What's the difference between the main breaker and branch breaker? Does that mean how much can branch out for different breakers? Um, that means it's at the incoming circuit breakers, your main breaker. Right. Okay, your main breaker is going to be rated the same as your bus. Okay, so an 800 or 600 amp main breaker and 600 amp bus is all the load that panel board can handle. When I talk branch breakers, I'm talking these feeder breakers that are mounted below the main off the chassis feeding individual loads. So this is a branch breaker, you know, in here. These will be stacked up, feeding one piece of light, next one feeds a receptacle. I guess they have like 0.25 amps, right? Like they have to lower 
which is yep, which is this one. So you you might run into cases where you've got a, some lighting and receptacles which are fed off of here, nothing more than 100 amp, and you're just fine. But you've got two elevators that you also need to connect. You don't want to have to put in a whole service, and you need 225 amp breakers to feed these elevators. So you need to squeeze some room to feed this breaker feeder breaker into that panel board. So at 225 amps, that gives you the ability to kind of create that hybrid panel board there. So if I may say one yep. thing, this will be the panel for your service. So it will be a 600 amp panel. So this will work up to you for your service table. And notice uh, on that point, service entrance equipment when required and specified on the order. So anytime you need service entrance, it's a uh, we need to know about it because we need to provide uh, from the factory the service entrance label. UL is pretty sticky about that in that if you don't order a service entrance, we can't just mail you a label and let you stick it on. It needs to be. Uh, Provided in the plant. So, so Todd, what's the difference that they do other than bugging the booster for the ground and the booster for the frame? What else do they just fit other than what's different than other than any other panel? Do they, do they have rigid tests that they do to it? Just, you know, just means of bonding the booster for the ground into the frame of the box. By code. Yeah, basically, so you, it's, a remo it's a removable neutral ground link. And I think in the cases of this panel, I'm not sure we even install it. I think we just put in a baggy small piece of cable with the grid so you can connect the ground and the neutral together and the mm -hmm. sticker that you throw on yourself. And the ground is tied to the frame anyway. Yep. Okay. Yep. No more tests that we can do because it Nope. And even in a switchboard, there's not a whole lot of difference. You think there should be. They make a big deal of it. It doesn't cost us hardly anything. And we don't really charge anything for it. But I don't know if it's the responsibility or something that they want people to know. I don't know. So this is what the 3A looks like. And when I was talking about the sub chassis here, these are these normal breakers at the bottom. So I can put a bunch of those standard breakers, but yet I create a little bit more chassis room to put those bigger breakers. And normal main brake, and we actually put the neutral in the middle of this panel. So that was uh, that's one kind of odd thing there. Now your power distribution panels, your power panels, uh, is the last step up, which is power line fours. And uh, this is a power line four B. Okay, we've already got all our uh, available voltages, uh, 240, 480, and 600. This one steps it all the way up to 1,200 amps. So 1,200 amp maximum for anything, main lugs, main breaker, 1,200 amp branch breakers. There's really no limitations. Anything you want to do under 1,200 amps can be in a power distribution panel. And all these circuit breakers, you can have a 1200 amp main breaker and a 1200 amp feeder breaker in the same panel if you want. No limitations. Now this one's a power line 4F. All right, last one was a 4B. This one's a 4F. Last one used circuit breakers. This one uses? Uses. B and F. Um, Everything else is exactly the same, 1,200 amps maximum across the board. Now, this was a 4B, 4F, B for breaker, F for fuses. We'll try to make it simple. Now, notice, you can put a lot of breakers. You see kind of how small these look? These are 225 amp breakers probably there. Take up this much room. That's a 400 amp breaker. And here's a whole. You can put all these small, many of these small ones as you want on there. Put a lot of breakers in that panel board. Now this one, this may be a couple of 30 amp switches. This may be a 100 amp switch. 
But notice how few, much many fewer switches and fuses you can put on a circuit breaker. Taking the covers off, you can kind of see why there's big switches on the side, and the fuses are much bigger, and you have to have them all separated by uh, by space. I believe this is the same size as one of these, the 400. So you will see the industry has shifted from you know, as recently as 10 or 20 years ago to today, almost exclusively to circuit breakers. Very rarely do I get an installation where they want fuses. And a lot of times people who want fuses um, are veterans. They've been doing it that way for years and they like to maintain that. Or they have electricians on their staff because they want to keep their electricians in work by changing fuses. Anybody can reset a circuit breaker, but an electrician is needed to change a fuse. Um, sometimes you get into certain coordination issues where you want to coordinate a load and an upstream and a fuse. Everything has a trip curve, and a fuse curve may work a little bit better than a circuit breaker curve in that instance. But, I, you know, I think fusible switchboards and fusible panel boards are probably down into maybe 5% or maybe 10% of what we do right now. So they're, uh, they're, they're tailing off. And, you know, it is possible you could actually, uh, we do actually sell circuit breakers and fuses in the same power line for panel board as well. The sizing of them, everything on the power line panel boards, uh, power line four panel boards, falls into an X space. And this is just uh, an industry term that goes around back to when people had to size panel boards with a pencil. Now computers do it all. But basically every panel board and you know, switchboard when we look at it is going to get 50 X of, of space allocated for breakers. Each X is one and three eighths inches. Why? What is that? Why would they come up with this? Okay. Typically on a circuit breaker, and I think they did it with like a three pole hundred amp circuit breaker like this, one and three in H one and three eighths inches conveniently is the size of one breaker pole. So when they did that, they were thinking a little bit. But the key to remember is there's a it's all driven again by how much stuff you can put in side of that box, and that's going to determine how many breakers or how many fusible switches you can get in there. And, and uh, Todd, just for the students here, you guys get involved in cycle tests. When, yes. when we come up with the size of 100 amp panel, the physical, mechanical size, you lay it out for us, and you came up with the actual physical dimension. Yes. You can do a guess, like as consultant engineers, but ultimately you have a shop drawing to decide all that. Correct. And, and panel boards, there's not a lot of variation on panel boards. You're not going to change a whole lot. Maybe these big ones, so we got a couple different options on those. Uh, but switchboards, which are coming up right next here, switchboards, a lot of what I do is sizing and laying out switchboards for consulting engineers to figure out how big do I need to make my electrical equipment room, uh, you know, to give it to the architect so he can plan accordingly. Seeing a larger and a larger amount of sub-metering uh, going on for uh, whether it's LEED certification or government municipalities. Everybody wants to know where their energy goes. Energy costs money. And the only way you're going to save money is if you know how much energy you're using and what's using your energy. So you're seeing more and more sub-metering uh, being pushed down and down into the, into the individual panel board devices or feeders themselves. Okay, and now we're just going to relate this up to switchboards. I always say switchboard is really just a big panel board. So your panel board, we talked about a 1200 amp main bus, looks just like that. The switchboard can actually go up to a 6000 amp uh, main bus. Now it's bigger than what you'd probably ever use, but it is available. And the switchboard is different in that it's multiple structures tied together. We build it as a framework. 
So you've got an actual uh, braces across the bottom and a square braces across the top and holes along the four corners and to create a whole solid frame uh, that is rigid. Sheet steel can cover the sides. Uh, right here you'll see the, the one exclusive thing about switchboards is you got the ability to do cross bus or main horizontal bus. So once you get your main, once you get your incoming line into your switchboard with horizontal bus, I can, like Lego, snap as many structures as I need to get all the feeder breakers I need. Panel boards, you know, you may be limited to 42 holes of types of, of loads, but a switchboard, you could put hundreds of three-pole circuit breakers in a switchboard if you so desire. They're freestanding, whereas panel boards are all designed to be either mounted on the wall or, in the case of the power line four, you can set it on the floor, but it's got to be supported by the wall. Power line uh, switchboards are freestanding. You can put them in the middle of the room or set them on the floor and push them against the wall because they're front or rear accessible, and we've got designs for both. While you have the 600 amp, 6,000 amp main bus, and practical purposes, your largest main breaker is going to be 5,000 amps that's available. And in the real world, you likely won't see anything over 4,000 amps. So from a cost-effective design standpoint, 4,000 amps uh, is a great maximum to use. And then the switchboards have the ability to, to do a bunch of different things, utility metering, customer metering. UL standard for that is UL891. Now the snapshot of what this, what you can include in here is uh, you can put in customer metering devices, which I'll talk about, utility metering compartments, pick your choice of main device, and then all your group mounted distribution, which this reality is just a panel board. So out of your main devices, same main lug only, main switches and main molded case circuit breakers. Once you get above 1,200 amps on a fusible switch, they actually move to what they call a bolted pressure switch. You know, it's much larger fuses, and uh, you got to be much more, uh, uh, need a lot more mechanical strength to be able to open and close those, those heavy, those higher amperage switches. Then you have two additional types of circuit breakers. Uh, the insulated case or the air power circuit breaker. Your molded case circuit breakers, which are these, the largest one available is 2,500 amps. Uh, 2,500 amps is not the largest that you're going to need circuit breaker wise. So we've got uh, um, Magnum DS or Magnum SB circuit breakers. One's an air power breaker, Magnum DS. One's an insulated case breaker, Magnum SB. SB. There's just different, more rigorous testing standards than a molded case breaker like this. And these testing standards kind of make the breakers get much more bigger. You know, you're talking uh, um, 18 inches, 24 inches high by a uh, foot wide. Why one of these would be beneficial is an insulated case or an air power circuit breaker allows you to have electrical operation. The opening and closing of these circuit breakers has to be done really with this operating handle on the front. And even at 2,500 amps, you need to have, because those springs in there are so tight, you need to have like an extension arm on the front of that breaker to open and close it. When you're opening and closing a, a breaker, is probably uh, a good chance of a fault. You're standing in front of the gear, you're manipulating devices, something could occur. When you're talking, the Magnum family of insulated case or air power breaker. Uh, you can electrically operate it because we put a little spring mechanism and a charging mechanism in there. And what that's going to allow you to do is put an open and close breaker on the wall, maybe around the corner, to run that circuit breaker. And if I'm standing here opening and closing the circuit breaker, and any incident occurs, or some, some blow up or a linkage busts or Maybe it's open now and I'm closing it for the first time and I forgot to 
take my screwdriver off, uh, you know, the lugs in the back. That failure occurs, you're in a safe zone versus a dangerous zone, and that bleeds into the whole day you can spend, and Chad may spend on our flash energy or, or the dangerous situations that occur with that. And I always, always say to talk to, if you have an arc flash incident, it will cost you, what, like $5,000 or something for a piece of equipment bricked across from you, and it was just as light. Yes, which there's no price on that. Yeah, and I know our company, and you know, growing up, uh, you know, back in the uh, in the in the '70s, there were some industries in my neighborhood that, more than once, you would read, so "There's another death on the oil refinery, another death in the oil refinery." Well, today, one of those incidents um, creates a hundred times at least more tension than it used to. One is unacceptable. We've got eighty thousand people working for our company and a lot of it's pretty heavy manufacturing and there's electricity so some of it can be dangerous when you're talking testing and design and R&D and that kind of stuff and zero deaths is acceptable for us one is not acceptable at all and we spend whatever it takes to make sure we hit that number of zero Here's a picture of your bolted pressure switches. A um, little bit bigger than a normal fusible switch. Manually operated one, standard open closed. This is an electrically operated one. Basically, just put a device on there so you can the the bolted pressure switch can open uh, via a signal. And why you would want to do that is if you have a service entrance application and a ground fault relay in there, you need to be tripping for a ground fault. And I think I got a slide coming up on that. So when you're talking the main devices as a switchboard, usually we mount them in a half a structure by themselves with some other stuff above and below and customer meters or any other devices around that. And uh, we can chassis mount the main breaker just like a Powerline 4B switch, 4B panel board. You can mount a 1200 amp breaker directly on the chassis. Looking at metering compartments, and Excel is kind of getting away with away from this, but a lot of parts of the country aren't. In that in a switchboard, the, the utility company mounts their provisions for metering the equipment, metering the customer's load inside the switchboard. So we'll just basically break the bus bars and we'll leave this open here. We'll leave this open here so the utility company can come in and put CTs in, in the bus bars, bar side CTs, to meter their load. And it'll kind of look like this, where they'll take their little watt arm meter, maybe it's a glass bulb, and nowadays they've got the uh, drive by remote monitoring type devices. And this is how the utility figures out how much they're going to bill you each month. Um, just two pieces of terminology you'll hear on utility metering compartments, hot sequence or cold sequence. In a hot sequence, here's your main incoming lugs, your utility compartment and the main breaker, which then feeds your rest of your load. That utility compartment is always hot whether that main breaker is open or closed. Okay, so if the utility company ever needs to get in there, they need to go upstream to their pole switch or something to open and close that to get into there. Cold sequence means you've got your incoming line, a main breaker, and then your utility compartment. So if you open and close the main, if you open the main, your utility compartment goes dead. Each utility company is going to have a specific requirement on how this should be. So for customer metering, this is right above a switchboard. Here's the main breaker. Right above the switchboard, it, when I talk customer metering, it's the ability for the customer to gather the information that he wants. Primarily, you're gathering information um, for energy usage. Whether well, it's kilowatts or kilowatt hours. Number one, if you're getting a bill uh, from the utility, it's kind of nice to be able to double check the utility, uh, how much they're billing you. 
not that they've never made mistakes or that they're foolproof. They're uh, people have been known to catch uh, large large electives have been known to catch um, overbilling and pay for an entire customer metering network that they put in just to check that. Other things that customer meters can provide uh, information wise is uh, voltage. If you think you're getting some bad voltage, you can always be able to go and double check uh, what's my voltage, how high have I gone, how low have I gone, um, or amps. If you're looking at expansion and you want to know how much room do I have left in my switchboard. I know I got a 4,000 amp switchboard. I can look at my meter and I can say, okay, my average draw is about 2,000 amps, so plenty of room for expansion. I don't send a switchboard out of our plants without some type of meter. If the customer doesn't ask for it, um, I'll make sure he gets it one way or the other. I'll tell him he's getting it or I'll say, uh, uh, I'll bury it and, and pay for it myself, but you, you need to have a meter on any incoming entrance to switchboard. The back of the switchboard, this is a, your horizontal bus right here. Say this is uh, A phase and B phase and this would be your incoming line here. We put the CTs, we bolt them to the red glassing material and these CTs are bolted right around the copper pieces and then the CT wires go right to the back of the meter. Now I won't get into too much depth, but just to make sure you're aware of the different types of customer meters that are available. Um, this one is an IQ 250, 260. Sometimes all you want, all you want are amps and volts. This one actually gives you kilowatts, kilowatt hours, so I'd probably modify that. Amps, volts, KW, KWH, um, power factor are probably the most important piece of information just for a basic meter. You can step that up from our IQ family to our Power Expert series. And what our Power Expert series does, it gives the same type of information that you're looking for, um, but it makes it Ethernet compatible. What, mo what a lot of people are doing now is, when I say Ethernet capability, you assign this meter an IP address, just like you can assign any other computers or anything else an IP address. Run a wire and plug that into the LAN, and then once it's got the IP address, it actually has a built-in web server, so you can sit at any computer that's inside the firewall, bookmark, and pop up the IP address, and you actually get a full page of the meter, and it can tell you all the values, and you can do this sitting at your desk or sitting at home on the weekend. Nope. Nope. Correct. Now, a lot of it would be just like the normal IT. So, if you've got a uh, if you've got a firewall around your intercompany's uh, IT infrastructure, like our we do, then then yeah, then the restrictions are the same that the IT guy would put on. If you're inside the firewall, you can do a lot more. And it's not like a plug-in meter. Oh. Try that. Oh, correct. That was your question? Yep. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be at the main panel. The meter itself? Yeah. Well. As long as it's tied into the system. Yeah. You, you put the meter wherever you want to monitor. So where the CTs go, that's where you want to put the meter. Now, you can have multiple. So a lot of times, if you've got one main switchboard, four power distribution panels, you can put a meter at the main switchboard and a meter at the four distribution panels. Yeah, each one of those, yeah, and I, now we get, we're probably stepping into a little complicated uh, yes. We've got actually devices that tie those together. But if they're at different parts, like usually maybe the four corners of a large building, um, equipment, electrical equipment rooms now almost all come with some type of Ethernet jack or something in it. I guess my whole thing was you couldn't put it in that panel board and let it figure out how much was coming into this building. Correct. It was in the yeah. Yeah, you have to look at where the CTs are located. So the meter itself is just, I'll call it a display for lack of a better word, or a transducer. 
the key the key is where you actually install the CTs. Those right there. That's your metering point. Now you can get long CT leads. You can install these in the switchboard. Run the meter. Punch maybe the switchboard's outside. Here's a good example. Switchboard's outside. You install your CTs there. You punch a hole in the water and you put the meter on the inside wall. You know, maybe you don't have the Ethernet capability, but now it's nice and inside and I don't have to put on my parka to check it every time. And there's, uh, Chad probably knows more of this, there's some distant limitations on how far you want to ride in CTs, but 50 or 100 feet, I believe, is probably suitable. Um, so I'll call that, uh, those two are energy meters. You know, just nice basic look, three-line LED display. Uh, you know, there's also an advanced meter that all the manufacturers have that I would classify as a power quality meter. So there's energy meters, lower cost, less functionality, and power quality meters, higher cost, more functionality. These will all have, you can see the, the meter comes in actually two pieces, so you can put the display anywhere you want the meter base or close to where your CTs are. And uh, the same Ethernet type connectivity. And the key is you can get the waveform. If, you, if you're looking at the waveform, you're chopping it up, uh, um, you know, say 100,000 samples per cycle on these things, if, if you wanted to push the envelope. And you can really break down the waveform and look at everything going on from the transient voltage standpoint. So a, a, like a data center or a, a microchip processing company, or where you manufacture microchips, you know, where any kind of power blip, and you got to throw away a million dollar batch of silicon wafers, things like that. They're really concerned about the power quality. This is one of those tools that can give you the information you need on that. And I mentioned the distribution sections are just uh, group mounted branch devices, just like the power line Ford. Um, the only difference is you can actually get, you know, up to 4,000 amp busing in these, but the, the branch breakers mount the same. Uh, for feeder devices also on a uh, switchboard, you can, once you get above the 1,200 amp chassis, you can mount two feeders, one on top of the other in one structure. Same SPD concept applies. Switchboards, uh, just like in meters, any type of service entrance point of a switchboard needs to have an SPD, a surge protector device, because the switchboard is the first point where any lightning surges are going to come from external into the building. So that's the first point of protection. We always believe in the cascaded approach where you'll have an SPD at the service entrance, maybe one or two in a distribution panel, and then your point of use plug-in surge strips. And each one of those levels as you go down in the system is going to increase your protection that much more. Same concept applies. Seeing a lot more uh, sub-metering devices on switchboards. It's a lot more common than panel boards. But switchboards, uh, you may uh, have a case where you want to meter all dozen. Think about a um, when they redid the old Sears building on Lake Street, the Midtown Exchange, I believe it's called. Now. They've got all these tenants. It used to be one building, all Sears, and now it's tenants. So the way they build their tenants for usage is by putting all these sub meters. So they'll have a dozen tenants, and each one will get a their own utility bill from the guy who owns the building that says, let's break this utility bill up accordingly by who uses what energy. All right, and uh, we'll touch down the service entrance point, but basically when you've got a, uh, once you cross that building wall and go from utility down into your facility, this is your service entrance point, this switchboard. So when we talked about uh, on service entrance equipment, uh, the service entrance must be located near the point where the supply conductors from the utility enter the building, or not even the utility. If you've got a, uh, a main building and two auxiliary buildings, it could be coming from one of your one of your uh, 
from your main building to your auxiliary building. Uh, you're limited on service entrance equipment to no more than six disconnects. So you can go main lug with up to six breakers on your service entrance board. If you've got more than six disconnects, you, you need to have a main break. And there's your disconnectable bond between uh, neutral and ground. Service entrance UO label must be factory attached. That's that uh, catch that they throw in there. And uh, ground fault protection is required for anything 1,000 amps or more on a solid ground system more than 150 volts to ground. So that's a 480-277 volt system, 1,000 amps or more, ground fault is required. Can you go back to that <clears throat> slide? Yep. This is one of the bits that gets a summarized service entrance panel. That's a good slide. That, that makes the service entrance panel different than any other panel. We, uh, we were talking when I was doing all this calculation, we looked at the service entrance panel, and then we did the panel. So, and you guys have access to all these PDFs. So, good, good resource. Thank you. Yep. Why, uh, why do you suppose NEC is requiring or putting a limit on only six disconnects uh, allowable? Or if you have more than that, you have to use a main breaker. What's the, what's the theory behind that? It's about what a service entrance means to the building, or more importantly, if a fire occurs. Fire truck rolls up, come flying into the building, fire going on, they want to be able to turn off one breaker to shut off the power for the entire building. Or NEC allows them to turn off six breakers. More than six breakers becomes a little too cumbersome and that's why they don't allow it. Okay. Um, Ground fault on service entrance then for a thousand amps or higher, it requires ground fault. And ground fault inherently is going to have this high resistance. This ground is going to not flow between the phase, it's going to head off somewhere down here. And a ground fault, because it has high resistance, it's going to have a lower amount of current. So, what you see typically on a main circuit breaker, you may have a 1200 amp main circuit breaker and you've got a fault ground fault condition going on that may only see 300 amps. Breaker will never trip with a 1200 amp trip unit, so you have to put a special trip unit in there to look specifically for ground fault, which is basically leakage current. You're, some current is going out through a conduit or something in your system and not following its normal electrical paths. Two basic types of ground fault uh, protection, zero sequence and residual. The zero sequence type is a single transformer that encapsulated around, that goes around all the phases, A, B, C, and neutral. And residual is individual CTs on each phase, one on phase A, one on phase B, one on phase C, and one on the neutral. The zero sequence looks at all the positives and the negatives currents you know it's a wave some are up some are down and any snapshot in time uh, because you've got a ct around all the phases any snapshot in time it should be zero. Zero is good if you get a ground fault and you're leaking some current down this ground fault path, it's going to follow back up here up to that transformer somewhere before it gets back into the system. You're missing that current. You're not adding it. So uh, it's going to it's going to basically sum those currents, determine there's some missing, and that value is then going to go to this ground fault relay, which is going to see a difference. Residual ground fault is individual CTs on each phase. Those CTs all send their positive or their negative values back to the ground fault relay, which then adds all the positives and the negatives. And if one of those 
I should say also with this, it's actually a fourth CT is needed in addition to that because these residual ground fault is actually embedded inside the circuit breaker. So I remember mentioned the circuit breaker. I said there's CTs on a solid state trip unit. There's CTs built in. That's well, great for A, B, and C, but there's no neutral that goes through a circuit breaker. So you wire in a separate sensor, wire that into the circuit breaker. And my pointer's going nuts here. But uh, so circuit breakers and the most cost effective means um, is to include your ground fault residual with, with the residual protection in the circuit breaker. Um, switchboard construction, you know, basically you've got one main structure and that's where you can determine what do I want for customer metering, utility metering, metering main breakers, uh, all that type of stuff. And then you can stack on as many distribution sections as you need until you got everything you need for your switchboard. Sometimes you have a pull section on a switchboard and basically that's a big metal box bolted to the next where you just terminate your cables. A lot of times you get underground cables uh, running into a system. If you think about uh, 4,000 amps, um, you know, you could have 12 cables per phase plus neutral. All of a sudden you got 40 or 50 cables all coming in. And in those cases, it's kind of helpful for the installing contractor to have a own dedicated section just for all those terminations. Now, one other thing on switchboards, uh, I don't think you guys have talked about busway yet. It's well, usually the next project. Bring the, bring the bus through the town, I guess. But uh, everything for, from panel boards discussions and switchboards discussions, the point has been about cables feeding from the utility or cables feeding out of the switchboard to a load. If you use a switchboard, you do have the option to connect busway. And what busway is, is you saw those copper bars on a switchboard quarter inch by four inch, quarter inch by six inch copper bars. Uh, that's basically a, a, a cable, except it's flat and skinny instead of round and circular. Well, you can stack up those bus bars, A, B, and C in neutral, and put a housing around it, and you know make a 2,000 amp piece of busway that's this size versus cables that have to run across a trailer and a conduit that are much larger and much more difficult. So the busway, switchboards have the ability to take this busway into that as a main breaker. And here's, here's what, uh, or main lug, I should say either way, but into the busway is a main device. And the busway itself looks like this. Oh, I advanced. Busway itself looks like this. And then this will be the top of your switchboard right here. Once you break the top of the switchboard, it separates out into an A, B, and C. But that was, uh, that's it on the discussion for that. Um, Consulting application guide, or I guess just briefly on the consulting application guide, we've got uh, uh, we've been making this application guide about every three to four years since the 1970s, and it's really become the industry standard uh, for electrical references. There's no pricing in there, and there's very little catalog numbers, but we've got a whole beginning of the section. First chapter is all electrical refreshers. You guys are seeing it now every day. You're sitting here, Chad's pounding in India, so it's probably no, not as a big deal for you. But for me, when I don't see something for a while, I'm going to have to go back and dig. It's got things on electrical formulas, information on generators, UPSs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we have specific chapters on uh, uh, metering, relaying, and some of the solid state components software wise. Um, and then we've got sections in the middle on medium voltage. When you get into 5 and 15 kV substates, we've got chapters that, that uh, talk about that. And, you know, the most important information that comes out of these is uh, if you're a, a 
a consultant trying to put this together, uh, this consulting guide is going to have a lot of the footprint or the layout information. It's going to have a lot of the technical information. So if you need to know ratings, if you need to know sizes, uh, heat loss, because your mechanical engineer next to you is going to say, what's that heat loss on that equipment you're putting in? We've got that published. So it's all the information that, that you're going to need from a, a design standpoint is included. So after the meeting voltage st structures we got in, or sections we got in there, we've got uh, uh, chapters on substations, and, and then it gets into the 480 volt or 600 volt and less. Switchboard, panel boards, switch gear, uh, busway, motor control centers, and then some stuff on the end that you'll find for uh, uh, application specific uh, generator powering gear, UPS equipment. Um, and touching briefly on the differences between switchboard and switch gear, and I, I think I kept her straight the whole time, but one of the biggest uh, gray areas in the industry is the difference between switchboard and switch gear. I'll often hear people say, I need to get some switch gear for my building. Well, what do you need? Well, I need a 400 amp panel. Well, that's not switch gear. That's a 400 amp panel board. Switch gear is a classification on its own. So switch boards have a UL standard. If you notice if you're from the pictures, uh, if you take the back cover off, everything's open. You've got breakers in there. You've got horizontal bus. Your cables are connected. There's really no barriers and everything's open, so if anything faults in there, and it can damage, I guess, as far as the fall can spread. It's designed to go against the wall and be a compact, low-cost, economical footprint and design. Switch gear uh, is a little bit different. Switch gear is designed to be uh, much more practical in use when it comes to uh, the safety thing. Everything is compartmented and barrier. In switch gear, and I'm talking 600 volt switch gear, 480 volt switch gear, your limit, each circuit breaker is it's enclosed in its own compartment. Steel on the top, bottom, sides, back, and a front door. And there's horizontal bus that runs behind the circuit breaker, and there's what they call runbacks that go from the circuit breaker through a barrier onto the horizontal bus. Now what this does is, number one, it limits you to four breakers in one structure. So you can see how the footprint can get a lot wider. Uh, but the individual compartmented barriers of the circuit breaker and the compartmentalness of the bus and the cables, which are actually the cable sections in the rear, uh, really increase the reliability. Because if a fault occurs, Everything with all the barriers in, things are going to be much more apt to be uh, up and running. You can get a fault, you can clear the fault, you can clean up the mess, and more than likely, most everything is going to be back and good to go. Switchboards are often placed against the wall at uh, you know 36 inches type deep. Switch gear, the standard design is 72 inches deep. Rear access is required because you'll have circuit breakers in the front, some busing in the middle, and cable compartments in the rear, and that whole thing is 72 inches. Now, NEC is going to tell you, in addition to that 72 inches, you need uh, three feet behind it for clearance and probably five feet in front of it for clearance. Um, now, we do have a hybrid switchgear design that is designed to be front access. I don't know if I ever mentioned that. You, but we took that 72 inch deep switch gear and we took breakers in the front, bus in the middle, cable compartment in the back. We took the cable compartment and we bent it 180 degrees so the cable compartment is now in the front next to the breaker. So it's twice as wide, but it's half as deep and you can push it against the wall. Front access only. Front access only. Industry uh, leader on that one. Nobody else has one. Um, and for switch gears, uh, probably 
think we can, uh, I'm hoping we can have you for the industrial at one time where we can talk more about it here. Sure. And the architects will be doing all the stuff. If there's big projects, an industrial project, there will be a three tier design, 4,000 4, plans, all executive service projects. Okay. So that will be it. And that's uh, when you want to talk, you know, all, all assemblies, switchboards and switchgears are custom. Switchboards are much easier to do, though. There's not, a, there's, you know, a limited number of choices. There's not a whole lot of wiring back and forth. But when you talk switchgear, I think I can honestly say no two switchgear lineups were ever created equal. Every one of them is different. Every one of them is custom and unique. And you can... You can pay as much as you want for the bells and the whistles that you want to include in that switch gear. You can put strobe lights on it, big alarms, bundles of control wires like this. Any other uh, questions on pretty much any topic? Okay. Well, I left the... Uh, I got cards up here. If anybody uh, wants to grab a card, just in case you need somebody to track down when you get out into the into the industry, whether you landed a consultant or a contractor, we got uh, about uh, 15 Eaton guys uh, in town here that call on everything from your uh, consulting engineers to your Hunt Electrics to your uh, 3Ms and everything in between. So, how long does it take you to make a switch gear when somebody knows what they want? You got about um, eight weeks just to get approval drawn. So you'll order the switch gear. Uh, take about eight weeks to do a drawings, a couple weeks for everybody to review the drawings to make sure it's accurate. And then I think right now we're about 12 to 14 weeks. So it's almost like a six month. Yeah, it's, it's pretty close to a half a year. Now, when times were good, uh, which probably wasn't more than five, six, seven years ago, um, those lead times get out to about nine months. Times are bad, they get closer to four months. And, uh, you know, we've got, when you get up to medium voltage, you're probably, uh, you'll never get less than six months when you're talking 5 kb or 15 kb switch gear. You're probably talking in the, uh, in the nine month on average for that type of gear. Long lead time stuff. And what Pat can help you guys when you go work in the industry, a lot of, in the last, what, I've been teaching in Denver for 10 years. In the last 10 years, we, the students who graduated from here go work for the Chef Fully Erickson. They are stuck with a situation where they have to sell the panel because I, I like what you did. You, you size for safety and also size for economy. We don't talk a lot here in the class about the economy of sizing, but the economy of sizing, Pat is going to be your friend it, 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 and the safety too. Because he can tell you instead of going to 600 amp switchboard, we might be get away with 400 amp if you are just this and that. So it's really, big, you do a good job, guys, in, in making a size for economy. Yeah. Yeah, and I popped into uh, Dunwoody graduates, everything from Mashad to Hunt, all those places I've mentioned. And all of a sudden, hey, didn't I see you in a class a couple of years back? And you know, sure enough. <coughs> So we'll see you out there. Okay. Well, thank you, Todd. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go and get my... Get something to my pointer in there.